Hey everyone and welcome to the Devcom Blockchain Village and we are here to present our talk on the title Verifiable Delay Functions for Preventing DOS or DDoS Attacks on Ethereum 2.0 So this is the agenda for our talk and at the very end of our session if the time allows uh, we'll try to pick up some of your questions and we'll try to answer as many as possible so wrapping up a quick speaker's introduction. So here am I. My name is uh, Tejas Sogi. I'm a penetration tester, a blockchain security researcher, uh, founder of Razorsec, uh, which is a community that helps people to learn about blockchain security. I'm also a YouTuber as Razor Sharp. I post uh, security contents on the YouTube. And the most important thing, I'm a cyber security enthusiast. I love the world of internet. Uh, with that, I will ask my partner, Mr. Gokul Alex, to say a few words about him. Thank you, Tejiswa. Hi, everyone. This is Gokul Alex. It's my pleasure and privilege to present in this platform in DEFCON in front of every one of you. I'm the founder of Epic Knowledge Society, one of the fastest growing digital education platform for engineers and entrepreneurs in India. Uh, we are a non-profit organization. I am also building a blockchain protocol integrating off-chain and on-chain data called Fusion Ledger. I am representing a collection of cryptocurrencies and platforms in India such as Algorand, Eternity, Elixir, Hashgraph, Horizon and Tezos. I'm also the director of Tezos India Foundation and I've been selected as the MVP for Hedra Hashgraph in 2018. I am a global leader for Access Collective created by David Chong, known as the godfather of cryptography and uh, blockchain technology. I'm a programmer and poet in my personal life. I've been a blockchain security auditor for government, public sector and private sector across various countries. I am actively researching on the convergence of quantum algorithms and post-quantum cryptography. Over to Tejaswa to get start with our presentation. Awesome. Now let's uh, just start our session and before moving to the attack vectors on proof of work, let's uh, get a quick refresher on some of the fundamentals. So let's talk about uh, what is a proof of work consensus algorithm. Now before that, let's talk about what a consensus algorithm. Now consensus algorithms decide like who should create the next block. And this decision defines uh, the basic fundamental property of blockchain, which is decentralization and decentralized control of power. Now uh, consensus algorithms is all about building fault tolerant fault resilient machines for distributive computing. Now our talk is about the convergence of cryptographic schemes and consensus algorithms. Now consensus algorithms have both deterministic and probabil probabilistic uh, dimensions, right? Now consensus algorithms helps us to achieve a consistent uh, state and agreement between participating nodes in a blockchain network getting back to our proof of work consensus algorithm now in proof of work consensus algorithm there are miners who compete with each other to uh, for the valid uh, potential valid block creation right now uh, there are certain factors involved like that uh, the block header must be less than a set threshold and then there is a mining difficulty now mining difficulty defines uh, like the current computational power of the blockchain network and it can also be updated at regular intervals to match the current uh, computational power of the network and it also ensures that the block creation should happen at a certain frequency now let's move on to some of the attack vectors or proof of work now in front of your screen you can see some of the attacks or attack vectors given uh, like the first one which says denial of service uh, distributed denial of service now let's uh, talk over this attack 
now as we have just uh, discussed about the mining difficulty uh, which defines uh, the processing power of the network and can be updated at regular intervals to match the to reflect the changes right in the processing power now uh, in most of the black uh, blockchain uh, these sudden changes in the processing power are not addressed by the nodes they can be addressed uh, by the nodes at a schedule update now let's take a scenario let's take a scenario of like there are nine machines on a blockchain network and six of them are malicious actors right six of them are malicious actors now they are not doing anything and just chilling in the network everything is going as planned mining it mining difficulty is working as the way it should block creation is happening at a certain frequency and everything is perfect now suddenly what the malicious actors decide they decide to turn their machines down now what will be the impact of this that now the remaining three machines uh, they have to do the work of nine machines and what will happen or what will be the impact of this that uh, the hash rate will decrease and it will uh, decrease the block creation rate and eventually create a denial of service right so there are other attacks as well like routing attack so routing attack consists of two parts uh, first one is the partition attack which divides uh, the blockchain network into two groups and then there is a delay attack which uh, tampers the propag uh, propagating messages and sends them to the network moving on and there are user wallet attacks then there are smart contract attacks uh, transaction verification mechanism attacks and there you can see the well known 51% of majority attack now what is this 51% of majority attack now let's take example uh, like there is a group uh, which is in majority a group of malicious actors which is in majority and uh, they can take control over the blockchain network now how it can be possible uh, as we know that there is a race between miners for the potential valid block creation now if there is a group of malicious actors uh which is in majority now uh, it will have this group will have a uh, higher and better probability uh, to be uh, for the block creation right so this is the 51 percent attack moving on uh, there are some uh, mining pool attacks uh, like selfish mining fork after with old and like that so moving on uh, let's talk over DDoS on Ethereum. Now there are some attacks that happened on Ethereum or there are scenarios as well. Uh, so we'll pick up some of them like there uh, was an attack on Parity Client. So what was the incident? Like some Parity Ethereum nodes lost sync with the network because of the following incident. Now what was the incident? That uh, if you send your Parity node a block with invalid transaction what will happen uh, if you send a parity node a block with invalid transaction but with valid header borrowed from another block and what will happen that the node will mark the block header as invalid and ban the block header forever but the header is still valid right moving on uh, there uh, was a vulnerability that was found in parity nodes as well so in May, Global Hacking Research Collective SR Labs claimed that only two thirds of the Ethereum client software that ran on Ethereum nodes had been patched against a critical security flaw discovered earlier this year. Uh, the data reportedly indicated that unpatched parity nodes comprised 15% of all the scanned nodes, implying that 15% of all the Ethereum nodes were vulnerable to a potential 51% attack. So moving on and there uh, is an interesting underpriced DDoS attacks. Now these are a group of attacks uh, which uh, exploited the vulnerability in the improper cast cost of EVM's opcodes. 
Now the opcodes were the EXT code size and the suicide opcode. Uh, the suicide opcodes was re uh, renamed to self destruct after EIP6. We'll talk about that in the next slide. So let's just uh, take the EXT code size, right? Now prior to EIP150 hard fork, the EXT code size opcode only charged 20 gas for reading a contract byte code from disk and then deriving its length. Now as a consequence, what happened or what can happen, uh, if the attacker uh, sent transactions to invoke a uh, deployed smart contract with many EXT code size opcodes, uh, it can cause a 2 to 3 times slower block creation rate. Also, there was a similar uh, attack that uh, exploited the vulnerability in the proper gas cost of EVM suicide upcode uh, that was renamed to self destruct as I just said. And uh, also the empty code vulnerability in the state drive. So the opcode is meant to remove a deployed smart contract, right? right? And then send the remaining ether back to the account designated by the caller. Now, if the target doesn't exist, a new account is created. Even though no ether may be transferred, but still a new uh, account is created. Now, what can happen, uh, like the attacker can create empty accounts and that was, oh, that happened, like that uh, uh, the attacker created 19 million uh, new empty accounts by the opcode at a very minimal gas consumption and which wasted disk space and increased uh, synchronization and processing time and caused a kind of denial of service right moving on to uh attack uh, uh the attackers uh, took advantage of the enterprise ddos uh, attack and that happened between the blocks mentioned in front of your screen uh, now what was the impact uh, it created millions of dead Ethereum accounts and also um, bloated the state database. Now, it also created tons of transaction traces as well. Moving on to the impact of DDoS attacks, uh, the enterprise one. Uh, what was uh, the impact that there can be hacks against Go Ethereum client? Uh, hacks can be created against huge amount of cleanup transactions and each cleanup transaction creates a large set of traces. Uh, there may be a possibility of hard fork being created and even if the hard fork is created, hard forks do not remove the dead accounts, right? Moving on to some of the quick fixes to the attacks like uh, scanning an initial set of transaction can be done, uh, measuring the traces from each transaction and also checking the frequency of traces in the transactions. Moving on to let's talk about the attack vectors on proof of stake. Now before covering uh, the attack vectors, let's uh, do a quick uh, refresher again on the proof of stake consensus algorithm. Now proof of stake is a popular alternative to proof of work. In proof of stake there are validators instead of miners and a validator is selected to forge a block. Also the validator selection uh, depends upon uh, the amount of uh, cryptocurrency a validator has or the amount of stake uh, a validator has and also on the current complexity of the network and uh, proof of stake has many advantages over proof of work uh, the first is obviously the security it provides a better security mechanism against 51 percent attack now as we know uh, like uh, in proof of work owning 51 percent of the computational power meaning means like gaining control over of the network but in proof of stake uh, owning 51 percent of uh, the stakes would be very uh, would be computationally very expensive for an attacker so that's how it provides a better security also it provides uh, but uh, it's uh, energy efficient and provides energy savings now also as uh, the ethereum 2.0 is ethereum is transitioning from ethereum 1 to ethereum 2.0 and it is transitioning from proof of work to proof of stake 
and there is a cash flow protocol uh, based on proof of stake it provides its own security implica implications uh, like uh, this slashing mechanism uh, which provides slashing of stakes as a penalty to the validator now if a validator validates a block it has been awarded uh, but if found that the validator is involved in malicious activity uh, the stakes will be slashed as a penalty and there might be a chance as well that uh, it can uh, lose its privileges to take part in the network consensus so this was uh, Casper protocol moving on to let's see some of the attack vectors uh, attacks against proof of stake you can see a list of attacks in front of your screen there is a fake stake attack a very interesting attack now fake stake attack can be think about as a denial of service an attacker can uh, devote uh, nodes uh, valuable memory and cpu to a fake chain now we know there is a longest chain rule says that any chain can suddenly become uh, the accepted version of the ledger uh, now validation of a proof in proof of stake is kind of complex now re required it require access to both the block header as well as the contents of block so like to trick the stake value for the validator selection right and forcing the node to download uh, data to validate fake blocks uh, it uh, consumes a valuable resources for the node and can eventually result into a denial of service right so fake stake attack can be think about as a denial of service uh, and proof of stake. Moving on to let's see the Ethereum 2.0 architecture. Uh, in front of your screen, you can see a beautiful picture uh, defining the roadmap to Serenity. Uh, then there is uh, the current blockchain uh, showing proof of work and proof of stake together. And then you can see a little bit uh, detailed architecture like there is a main chain based on proof of work then there is a beacon chain uh, uh, based on the casper ffg protocol the proof of stake protocol that we just discussed and uh, random number generation happens here. now you can see that uh, the beacon chain is cross-linked with the shard chain and underneath there is execution engine as well moving on to see some of the ethereum 2.0 audit findings uh, talking about the constant audit first now constant did an audit as well and founded uh, some repo uh, founded some uh, ddos attack vectors possible ddos attack uh, attack vectors and reported them uh, like ddos attack through creating a mapping between uh, public keys and validator ips also did a uh, ddos attack on insecure grpc uh, connection so what was the constant audit uh, basically it involved 10 engineers who examined the entire code base over the course of two months they examined the beacon node logic validator client flasher logic and almost everything so what were the findings they found a lot of vulnerabilities uh, some of them are like granularity of timestamps pseudo random number generation where two random uh, number generation were needed and then a uh, second pre major attack on Merkle trees as well uh, now let's talk about the least authority audit as well so they did a, uh, an audit over various subsections like uh, they did a audit over block proposal system uh, what were the findings like a uh, single secret leader election SSLE keeps a selection secret and stops the leak of information to an observer while still allowing the chosen block proposer a fast way to verify to others that it is in fact the proposer uh, with the information leak passed the block proposer remains as protected as it is it would be in proof of work chains uh, but without the computational overhead now, talking about uh, the findings on the gossip protocol now gossip protocols generally suffer from the spam problem 
without a centralized judge. It can be difficult to understand whether a message is legitimate or is spam that is meant to clog a network. Uh, this was one of the primary concerns in examining the network layer. Uh, in Ethereum 2.0, when a node proposes a new finalized block, the block must be sent to the rest of the network. There is an issue with a, uh, when a dishonest node is capable of sending an unlimited amount of older block messages to the rest of the network with a minimal penalty, which allows them uh, to overwhelm the network and block legitimate messages. Also, uh, they were finding on slashing messages uh, that we just uh, discussed earlier, the Casper protocol security implication. Now, there is a small loophole as well that allowed a node to send an unlimited amount of these types of messages with minimal penalty, causing the same message blocking if they send enough of them. Now, moving on to talk about DDoS on Ethereum 2.0, uh, let's take the recently happened a takeover attack scenario. Now, there were uh, security engineers who uh, did uh, research over public attack nets. They found a takeover attack, created a takeover attack. Now, what was the scenario like? Two of the four takeover nodes were targeted by five ordinary machines with a sustained DOS attack. Now, what was the impact? That initial loss of finality was achieved. With two or three machines, uh, but the others joined with a few epochs to ensure that the network could not recover. Now, what was the implementation? You can see a command in front of your screen. So, what the command does, it pipes uh, the null byte from Dave's view to the PV command, which uh, rate limits to a somewhat arbitrary uh, value high enough to prevent finality. Uh, but stay off uh, AWS and uh, IPS radars to ensure the attack continues. Also, the data is then uh, piped back into the uh, netcat command, which sends it to the nodes under attack. Uh, the while loop is there uh, for when it loses connectivity and command compiles due to container restarts. Moving on to what was the impact of this takeover attack. The effect that the denial of service attack had on the attack net was a prolonged loss finality and required manual intervention to restore the network to a healthy state once the attack stopped. Now, the nodes on the attack used large amounts of memory, were subject to multiple container restarts, had trouble staying connected to peers, and even once nodes log uh, local clock was like 20 minutes low. Now moving on to the take attack root cause. Now firstly responding to one byte when multiple bytes is a vector we know for various ampl amplification attacks that we know but that was not the issue that caused the loss of finality. The second issue is that the responses were being written faster than they were read by the attacking fear and the JVM lib P2B was not applying any throttling. Eventually, the TCP pressure back pressure kicked in, filled up the OS write buffers, and the responses wound up being queued in user space memory. This pushed up both the on and off heap memory users uh, very substantially. Also, CPU uh, spikes significantly partly due to the processing power. All those uh, due to processing all those multi-stream messages, but mostly because of the resultant memory pressure and GC activity. Now, talking about what can be a solution, uh, it's like uh, there can be a straightforward solution like disconnect the PR immediately when an invalid uh, example like zero land multi stream message is received. And now, also, there's a resilience to DOS attack as well, uh, which increases significantly as you increase the number of nodes and diversity of clients, locations, and network connections. So, this was the take attack. We covered uh, consensus algorithms, we talked over proof of work, proof of stake, we uh, took uh, different attacks, attack vectors as well, we talked over 51% attack, denial of service, we have seen the ATM 2.0 architecture, 
also the security implications of Casper protocol. Now my partner Mr. Google Alex will connect with you all the links, the PDF, uh, randomness and DDoS and will connect all of them and present it to you. So over to you sir. Thank you Tejas for, for setting the context for this researching on the randomness in Ethereum 2.0. We will see how randomness is very crucial to the overall engineering and overall design of Ethereum 2.0. If you look at all the current implementations, be it on near protocol, prismatic labs, the beacon chain, there is a crucial play for randomness because all the sharding designs today rely on some source of randomness to assign validators to the shard. Both the randomness and the validator, validator assignment require computation that is not specific to any particular shard. For this computation, existing designs have a separate blockchain that is tasked with performing operations necessary for maintenance of the entire network. Besides generating these random numbers and assigning validators to the shards, these operations also include receiving updates from shards and taking snapshot of them. This is very important. The shards and taking snapshot. Uh, if you know the shard is nothing but a database activity. In older times, we used to take editions, cut editions from the databases. The snapshots are the read-only versions. And also when we process the stakes and slashing in proof of stake systems, and when you have to uh, plan the proximity of shard with the lead leaders and rebalancing the shard, these randomness so sharding staking and randomness has to work together when you look at all this uh, implementations whether it's uh, cosmos hub in cosmos or relay chain polkadot or beacon chain in ethereum and near this is the overall architecture but we have to understand we cannot afford any simple randomness we need distributed randomness on blockchain that is why Randomness in blockchain becomes much more complex and more challenging. So many blockchains, if you know, blockchains have different purpose of using randomness. Maybe it's for time stamping, or it could be for games like lottery games, or it could be for proof of replication, like in Filecoin, or in the case of Ethereum beacon chain for selecting participants. What happens if a malicious actor can influence such a source of randomness? They can increase the chance of being selected and possibly compromise the security of the protocol. And like we said, distributed randomness is very crucial building block for any kind of applications on blockchain. What are the essential properties of randomness required in a blockchain setup? There are three essential properties laid out. First, it needs to be unbiased. We cannot afford a biased source of entropy. In other words, no participant shall be able to influence in any way the outcome of the random generator. Second, it needs to be unpredictable. In other words, no participant shall be able to predict what number will be generated or what are the properties of it. Thirdly, the protocol needs to tolerate some percentage of actors that go offline or try to intentionally stall the protocol, like the conventional crash fault tolerance and Byzantine fault tolerance. Now we will look at some of the existing approaches. One of the first approaches is the RANDAO approach, which is the acronym for random DAO. The general idea is that the participants in the network, first of all, privately choose a pseudo random number, submit a commitment to the privately chosen number. This commitment could be implemented as a polynomial commitment or a Pedersen commitment all agree on some set of commitment using a consensus algorithm. Then all reveal the chosen numbers, reach a consensus on the reveal numbers, and have the XOR of the reveal numbers to be the output of the protocol. This is a pretty straightforward approach, but there are some limitations. It is fairly unpredictable, but at the same and it has liveness. We know liveness and safety are two required properties of any consensus mechanism. This provides a great degree of liveness. However, a malicious actor can observe the network once and start to reveal the numbers and choose to reveal or not to reveal the number 
based on the XOR of the number they observed. This allows a single malicious actor to have one bit of influence on the output and a malicious actor controlling multiple participants have as many bits of influence as the number of participants they are controlling. The, so there is a proposal and there is a uh, strong uh, support in this direction, which is to blend Randao plus VDF. We will talk about VDF in detail. First, let us understand this approach. To make Randao unbiasable, one approach would be to make the output not just an XOR, but something that takes more time to execute than the allocated time to reveal the numbers. If the computation of the final output takes longer than the reveal phase, the malicious actor cannot predict the effect of them revealing or not revealing the number. So we are talking about a computation which is sequential, which cannot be paralyzed by a powerful malicious adversary. Such a function that takes a long time to compute is fast to verify the computation and has a unique output for each input. It is called as verifiable delay functions. And the design is extremely complex, which we will talk in detail. What is Ethereum's perspective on random DAO plus VDF? You can find numerous conversations on this in Ethereum research led by Justin Drake and others. Ethereum presents a plan to use random with VDF as their randomness beacon. Besides that fact, this approach is unpredictable and un un unbiasable. It has an extra advantage that it has liveness, even if only two participants are only. This is a very interesting property. It requires very, very li less live participants compared to any other approach. For the family of VDF linked above a special ASIC, it can be 100 times faster than conventional hardware. That is why there is a strong effort and investment in Ethereum currently to build ASIC uh, hardware for VDFs. So if the reveal phase lasts only 10 seconds, for example, VDF computed on such an ASIC must take longer than 100 seconds to have 10x safety. And does the same VDF computed on the conventional hardware need to take 100 into 100 seconds in three hours? Hence, there, there comes a dependency on a hardware. That is the uh, uh, challenge because of this approach or the trade-off in this approach. Now let us look at a, an early approach, which is fairly uh, very popular. This approach is pioneered by Definity. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, more than one year back or two years back, Definity is to use BLS signature. What is BLS signature? It is known as Bonnet line Shazam signature. One of the authors of this cryptographic scheme, Ben Lin, is actually a member of Definity. What is this BLS signature? This is a scheme allowing a user to verify that a signer is authentic. This scheme uses a bilinear pairing for verification. We know about bilinear, bilinear maps in elliptical cryptography, how powerful and formidable they are. So this is a signature scheme built using bilinear pairings. BLS signature is a construction which allows parties to create, multiple parties to create a single signature on a message, which is often used to save the space and bandwidth by not requiring sending around multiple signatures. This is a very interesting property and becoming very, and hence BLS signatures are becoming very popular in more crypto uh, currencies, more cryptocurrencies and blockchains. A common usage of BLS signatures is in signing BFT protocols, uh, use for signing blocks in BFT protocol. When we look at threshold signatures in practice, say there are 100 participants to create blocks, and a block is considered final if uh, two by third of them, 60, 67 of them sign on it. They can all submit the parts of the BLS signature and then use some consensus algorithm to agree on 67 of them and aggregate them into a single BLS signature. Any 67 parts can be used to create an ac accumulated or aggregated signature. However, the resulting signature will not be the same depending on what 67 signatures are aggregated. It turns out that the private keys that participants uh, use are generated in a particular fashion. Then no matter what 67 or less signatures are aggregated, the resulting multi-signature will be the same. This can be used as a source of randomness. 
the participants first agree on some message that they will sign. It could be an output from a randao, or it could be the hash of the block. It really doesn't matter as long as it is different every time and is agreed upon. So the, here we are blending both randomness and an agreement to create a multi signature on it. But this has some limitations. The approach, as we have seen earlier, this is even though this is unbiased and unpredictable and is live as long as two by third of the participants are online, though this can be configured to any threshold, while this one by third offline or misbehaving participants can stall the algorithm, it takes at least two by third participants to cooperate to influence the output. This is a, a big overhead when you consider a live blockchain system. Uh, private keys in the scheme need to be aggregated in a particular fashion. And this process is known as distributed key generation. And this is something which, which is an ongoing area of research. And there is another interesting approach called RAND share approach. RAND share approach is an unbiased and unpredictable protocol which can pro tolerate up to one by third of actors being malicious, which is relatively slow. And the paper linked also describes two ways to speed it up called RAN hound and RAN herd. But unlike RAN share, RAN hound and RAN herd are relatively complex. When you look at the details in the paper, you can understand the general problems of RAN share, besides the large number of message exchange, it requires a lot of back and forth communication between the participants. In fact, O to the uh, O N to N cube messages are required. So this is kind of a uh, uh, kind of a gossip. The fact that one by, while one by third of the meaningful threshold for liveness is only there, but the the it is low for the ability to uh, influence the output. So the challenge one is the overhead because of the number of communications required, and second the number of live participants required. So this is the challenge. The benefit of uh, the benefit from influencing the output can significantly outweigh the benefit of stalling randomness. Am I audible now? Okay, this one. Can you confirm? Am I audible? Yes, yeah, sir, so you are audible. Okay, okay. So let us continue. The benefit from the influencing the output. This is one uh, trade off when we consider a randomness design. So either the adversary can stall the randomness or influence the output. So this is what we have to see in RAN share approach. If a participants control more than one by third of the participants in RAN share and use this to influence the output, it leaves no trace. This is a challenge. Thus, a malicious actor can do it without even ever being revealed. Stalling a consensus is always visible. So if somebody stall a consensus or create a fork or uh, you know, disrupt the network. This is visible. But if they influence the output, that leaves no trace. So that is the two uh, aspects of this challenge. And then the, there are situations in which someone control one by third of the hash power, having a very powerful machine, uh, a sick miner, or some kind of a uh, very powerful staking pool. Uh, so we can't always say that that is an unimaginable or impossible situation and hence uh, this is this rand share approach ha creates some kind of a doubt or uncertainty so we we should look at the near protocol approach in this scenario what near protocol has done near protocol is one of the first to come up with a uh, sharding implementation for ethereum 2 uh, like a candidate for ethereum 2 and now they are building the protocols uh, uh, as a separate protocol. Each part. So what happens in near protocol? They have come up with an approach called erasure code. Let us understand what is this erasure code. Each participant comes up with their part of the network, split it into 67 parts. So this erasure code, it is generated to obtain 100 shares such that any 67 are enough to reconstruct the output. And then they can assign each of the 100 shares to the participants and encode it with the public key of that participant. Then they can share all the encoded shares. Participants 
use some of the consensus it could be any little base protocol like tendermint to agree on such encoded set extracted from the 67 participants once the consensus is reached each participant takes the encoded share in each of the 67 sets published this way that is encoded with their public key then decodes all such share and publishes all such decoded shares at once once at least six 67 participants did in the previous step all agreed upon the sets fully can be decoded and reconstructed the final number can be obtained as an XOR of the initial part of the participants which came up in the first step the idea why this protocol is unbiasable and unpredictable is similar to the RAND share and threshold signature approach the final output output is decided once the consensus is reached but is not known to anyone until two by third of the participants decrypt shares encrypted with their own public key so when we look at all these previous approaches on one side we can see uh, the verifiable delay functions very solid with uh, cryptographic technique and threshold signatures also a cryptographic scheme we can see that randavo ran share and the in, uh, erasure code from near protocol these are all uh, a specific consensus based approaches so one side we have uh, threshold signatures verifiable delay functions other side we have ran share ran hound and ran herd now let us look at verifiable delay functions in detail what is an anatomy of a vdf a vdf consists of triple of algorithms setup evaluate and verify a setup takes two parameters lambda and t the security parameter lambda and the delay parameter t and they it generates a public parameter pp which can fix the domain and range of the vdf and we can add some additional information necessary to compute or verify it the second phase is evaluation phase where you take the public parameter from the previous phase add an input text from the domain and generate an output value y in the range and generate a short proof pi finally in the verification phase you use the combination of public parameter x y and pi efficiently to verify that y is the correct output on x so crucially for every input x there should be unique output of y when you look at the historic inspirations to vdf we should first look at the early works of Cynthia Dwork and Moni Naur in early 1990s, who suggested using squaring roots over finite fields, finite field-based puzzles as functions, which take a predetermined time to compute and are very straightforward to verify. Incidentally, the same Cynthia Dwork and Moni Naur has inspired uh, Satoshi Nakamoto in his pioneering work on peer-to-peer -peer cash in Bitcoin. However, their work was considered impractical then because one has to use rather large finite fields to make algorithms useful. And libraries for handling multiple precision arithmetic at the time of the suggestion was order of magnitude slower than the current ones. So we can so you see that even a lot of prog promises on elliptical curve cryptography, which uses finite fields, came only in the early 2000s. What are the essential properties of VDF? Now I have seen how do we construct a VDF. What are the essential properties? Firstly, it has to be sequential. Honest parties can compute y and pi given we have public parameter and x in t sequential steps, while no parallel machine adversary with a polynomial number of processes can distinguish the output uh, y from random input significantly in fewer steps so this is very important the output should be indistinguishable with any other randomness even if the adversary has a polynomial number of processes so that they can compute they can execute all of them uh, in a very efficient polynomial time they should not be able to distinguish this output from vdf from other randomness and it should be efficiently verifiable the verify operation should be as fast as possible for honest parties to compute. So the verification time should be as small as polynomial logarithm of the time taken to generate it. 
or construct it and it should be unique as we have said if before for every input x it should be difficult to find an y for which the same combination of public parameters x y and pi gives the same output now there are some more additional properties of VDF very important for actual implementation. One of the first one is it should be decodable. A VDF is decodable if there exists a decoding algorithm such that the combination of evaluate and decode form a lossless encoding scheme. This is very much required for a practical use of VDF and it should be implemented. Uh, hi sir, uh, sorry for interrupting. Yes. Uh, so we can take like uh, 10 more minutes of because it's already uh, like just 30 so yep yeah, yeah i'll move fast so the second property yeah. is the incremental property which will help us to compute the output with uh, zero knowledge proofs or any recursive proofs and the size should be smaller and the main innovations if you look at the main vdf constructions are the first construction is in the original paper by dan bonnet Ben Fish and others in 2018, which uses injective rational maps. But however, this is a very complex implementation, and hence, even the author said this is a weak VDF. Later, two other approaches were proposed by Pazark and other by Veslovsky independently, arriving at ex extremely similar constructions but more practical by using repeated squaring in groups of unknown order. These constructions are based on modular exponentiation arithmetic, where Pesark and Veslovsky suggested to iteratively compute squarings in RSA groups with a large uh, prime modulus. Innovations in VDF. One very crucial difference in VDF with others is VDF has a setup phase. Uh, in the setup phase, we set the public parameters for configuring the VDF. So any node who need to solve the VDF will use the public parameters. And some VDF also allow generating a proof so that you can use this in conjunction with the computational proofs of integrity. And so, and we can use it in a multi-party computation setup. Now let us see how we can use VDF for DDoS prevention. The, one of the first approach for using VDF for DDoS prevention was from IOTA. IOTA is a IoT ledger which uses Tangle consensus, which is not strictly a blockchain, but they have come up with a lot of innovations in cryptography in the past, like uh, they have adopted Windernet's one-time signature. So what IOTA has implemented is a DOS prevention mechanism. I IOTA is actually an IoT ledger with heterogeneous IoT devices. So they propose to use uh, VDF for VDF as a DDoS prevention mechanism where nodes are required to compute exactly the prime modular squarings for an input message. Calibrating the VDF evaluation on different hardware and optimizing the time need to verify the correctness of the puzzle through multi exponentiation techniques. That is what they have done. So what they have done is they have used different kind of hardware like laptops, FPGAs and different IoT uh, hardwares uh, like Raspberry Pis and uh, different other devices and then they optimize the time they ca continuously calibrated what would be the time for constructing the uh, vdf evaluating the vdf and verifying the vdf so they con they compared it with for their purpose actually uh, iota doesn't have a, a system like a proof of stake hence their concern was how to use it instead of proof of work and that's how they use vdf so how did they use it in the evaluation phase, every node decides to generate a transaction and all those nodes need to solve a VDF such that the input is the hash of the transaction uh, issued by the same node. And the proof that they generate, the node also generate a proof to facilitate the verification task, which gossip along with the transaction. So they share the proof along with the transaction. Verification happens when a new transaction is received the node, a particular node verifies whether the VDF is solved correctly by the node which sent the transaction. If yes, it forward the transaction. You know, in IOTA, it has 
some kind of tipping mechanism or forward mechanism where every node which receives an input has to send it to two other nodes. That is how the tangle works. Let us look at how VDF integration happen is implemented in IOTA. There are evaluators and uh, evaluators evaluate and generate the proof from the input to the VDF. They use both hash and the VDF. And then when they generate transaction, transaction also will have VDF in it. And then the verifier will verify whether the VDF is accurate, which they can do it fast. If it is true, they broadcast to neighbor. If it is false, they discard it. We can configure the difficulty and the modulus in this VDF implementation IOTA. This is an important property which is mentioned. VDF difficulty can be configured. That determines the number of sequential operations to solve and update the VDF. The second one, the, R, the prime modulus, the RSA modulus, which we use for the RSA based groups of unknown order. And the third thing, they also use a cryptographic hash function. Now let us quickly talk about our approach. Our approach is based on a closer view at what is required for Ethereum 2.0 and what are the current capabilities we have in 2.0 like sharding, stake, and random, random oracles and also the presence of different proof, uh, zero knowledge proof implementations. But one key difference what we would like to propose is we are proposing VDF based on super singular isogeny cryptography, not based on the RSA based uh, unknown groups of unknown order approach or adiabatic uh, uh, adaptive root assumption approach of uh, Pistrack and Wislowski. We also wanted to bring in an approach known as single secret leader selection. And we want to use this VDF for selecting a secret leader, a single secret leader from data shards each time. And we, we also want to use them in conjunction with random oracles. And we want to authenticate the nodes participating in stake mechanism using VDF based delay authentication, which is also proposed recently. And then we, we want to use randomness, ran share and ran hound powered beacon chain. So this is how we visualize our approach. We use isogeny based VDF generator and these VDF generators will be used to create random oracles. These random oracles will source to the shard chains with ran hound and ran share. And that's how we decide which shard to move in the proximity. And then the shards will be part of the beacon chain where we will have a secret single leader selection and delay authentication. And then finally, it will be added to the main chain based on uh, hi, sir. Uh, sorry again for interrupting uh Ajay, sir is saying we can like conclude our talk so we can just yeah. quickly uh, wrap up and just talk about the isogeny right yeah, yeah sure. i'll just quickly show what we have we have already done a prototype on this random oracle using the vdf from the starkware you can see the code in our repository and uh, we also giving uh, the highlight of the single secret leader election mechanism. You can find the research paper which is substantiating this again from Dan Bonnet and uh, the node topology. And please let me hand over to uh, Tejaswa to talk about the beautiful aspects of isogeny based VDF quickly. Uh, so, hey everyone, uh, I will just quickly wrap up our presentation and uh, we are just in more finale. And I, I will just quickly uh, talk about the isogeny based VDF. Now, what is an isogeny? Uh, it is based on the fun, uh, idea of elliptic of uh, cryptography and the Hellman key exchange. So, uh, in isogeny, there are a group of elliptic curves. So, you can think about that there are two elliptic curves, E1 and E2. Uh, we can uh, do a mapping or a function of, like, let's say, point P from elliptic curve E1 to point Q. Uh, at elliptic of uh, uh, E2, and this mapping is called as the isogeny. Now, our secret here is then the isogeny here, and the public key you can think about as the elliptic curve. And uh, we can do a, a secret share exchange by mixing our secret key with the other side's uh, elliptic curve. Uh, next slide. Next. Uh, next, moving on. Uh, so, yep, let's see a quick construction. So we'll set up, uh, uh, we'll take a prime number n, 
will take a super singular curve E and performing a random non backtracking walk of length T have as outcome the isotony phi and its dual as phi dash. I'll, I'll, I'll call it as phi dash. Now choosing a point P uh, will compute the isogeny of the point P and they will be output as isogenic dual, the elliptic of E and E dash, the point P and the isogeny of point P. Next. Uh, this is how isogeny look like, uh, mapping between two elliptic curves. Next. And the final slide, uh, the, how the evaluation, uh, evaluation and verification works uh, in an isogeny based video. So for the uh, evaluation, uh, if we are receiving a random point Q, uh, we have to compute the isotonic dual of uh, uh, that point Q. And for the verification part, uh, we will uh, like refer to our previous knowledge of the slides, uh, which were field pairings. So how the verification can be done, it's just simply a field pairing of the point Q, uh, of the point P uh, with the isogenic dual of the point Q, and that should be equal to the field pairing of isogeny of the point P and uh, the point Q. So having said that, we are done with our presentation, and I will hand over to Google Sir to say the final words. Uh, it's a great honor for us to present our uh, compilation of thoughts on applying uh, powerful properties of randomness, unbiased randomness and entropy for the overall transformation of the uh, consensus and cryptography and to make Ethereum 2.0 much more stronger and make sure that every chance of DDoS attack can be prevented from the sharding shard to the main chain itself. Overall, so this is a randomness engineering that we propose. We have done our first uh, level of prototype. We would like to move to the next level by integrating isogeny VDF from the SIDH library and the SS isogeny library. And then we would also want to blend single secret leader selection. And uh, we would like to do it on the Randavo. We have already participated in the Starkware VDF hackathon. We have used the Vido VDF from Starkware and build random oracles and applied on Randavo. Now we are uh, excited to go forward. Thank you so much again for Blockchain Village, DEFCON for giving us this opportunity. It's an honor. It's a, a lifetime opportunity for us. Thank you so much once again. Looking forward to your questions and comments.